Happy Sunday and welcome back to Life Point Church. My name is DJ, head of the video ministry here at Life Point Church, and we want to welcome you back this Sunday. I hope your week was amazing. And by popular demand, yet again, we are showing another sermon from the series Incredible Family. And today we're going to be watching The Incredible Parents. Now, what exactly does it mean to be an incredible parent? Most of us know a few chosen scriptures such as honor thy mother and thy father and spare the rod and spoil the child, which is one that I've heard a lot of. Most of us are raising our kids based on habits that we've learned indirectly and directly from our parents. So for all of the parents out there, I want you to pat yourself on the back and give yourself a break because there is no handbook for raising children. Or is there? Stay tuned for Incredible Parents. Amen, amen. Everybody give it up to DJ and the video ministry because they are doing a phenomenal job and they are allowing us to get the gospel outside of just the four walls that we're in. And uh, we're, we're blessed to have you on our team, DJ. And uh, like we said, we are looking for people who are willing to partner with us um, to help this mission go forward. Um, real quick, I'll talk to you guys, but if you have your Bible, can you open it up to the book of Job? The book of Job, chapter one. Go ahead, stand with us. We're going to read these first five verses, and then I'm going to let you guys sit down. But Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys and very many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Let's just go ahead and pray real quick. Abba, Father, we just come into your presence right now. We ask that you would speak to us today, oh God. Lord, uh, we realize that you have made family. Uh, it's not a fluke that we've been placed in the families that we've been placed in. And God, we ask that right now you would build us up and tear us down, God, in such a way that you can get out of us what you want out of us so that we can build incredible families, Lord. Father God, we just pray right now, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts, that you would just take anything about us, our ideals and ideologies and philosophies, and just rip them down, oh God, and just allow your word to speak to our lives. God, anything that's in us that is not looking like your word, would you transform it? God, would you regenerate it? And uh, would you make us new in you? Your word does say that, behold, I make all things new. So, God, would you do that in our lives? Right now, I pray that you would remove me, would you remove my brokenness, my sinfulness out of the way, O oh God, and that you would allow your word to reign supreme. Hide me behind the cross. Speak for yourself. Glorify yourself and exalt yourself. In the mighty and matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. So once again, we've been in this series called The Incredible Family. And so as we come to this point now, we've we dealt with the fact that Family as a whole is important to God. We dealt with the fact that God has chosen that he wants to move through families to change the landscape of the entire world. He wants to change your neighborhood through your family. He wants to change everything about the world, and he's chosen to do it through family. So we want to see repairs going. We want to see husbands become godlier husbands. We want to see wives become godlier wives. And, and that in and of itself is a work. But there's another work we have to do, and, it, and it's about being godly parents. And here's one of the things I, I want to deal with. We have to become people who are intentional about working on things. A lot of us, we, we go about and we get so busy in life and we're doing and we're doing and we're doing and, and we're just parenting as the day gives us. But how many of us realize that any relationship that you are a part of needs work for it to flourish? You know, I, I didn't understand this saying when I was younger, people told me, I said, I want to get married one day to say marriage is work. I'm like, Psh, what do you mean marriage is work? Anybody married know that marriage is work, that it takes work for people to stay together. Can I get an amen on that? All right. Well, let me tell you this. Parents, to all my parents out here, the kids may not realize it, but how many of us know as parents that parenting is work? 
Oh, come, can I get another? I need an amen. Maybe, maybe you all came from such a proper upbringing and everything went so well in your life and your parents were perfect and it was just like Timmy and Lassie's family and or the Cleavers and everything was perfect. But for me, where I came from, things weren't perfect. And so I come from a background where there's a lot of things that I need to learn in order to be a good parent. Maybe I'm the only person in here who at times wants to take their kid and just put them up against the wall. Is there another person in here who's ever felt like that? Okay. My brother Jason Harris, I don't even know how you do it because you got basically three large boys in the house. Okay? And they all play football. And I'm sitting there like, if I had teenage boys in the house, there would probably be real fights right now at this current place where I am. So I don't even know how you do it. You know, parenting is work. And each of your children is unique and different, and we have to try to meet them where they are, know them where they are, love them where they are. Anybody know that it's hard to love people where they are sometimes? It is. I've got three children, and each of them is unique. I've got one who's the diva, one who's the chill, and then my boy is just like pure boy. He just, if, I, if he can run around and dive in dirt, he's okay for the day. You know, so I'm sitting there like, great, just go dive in the dirt. I'll deal with the other two. They're each different, and we're trying to love them where they are. So parenting is work. It's hard. So one of the things I wanted us to to figure out is what things do we need to start to focus on as parents in order to be better parents? We can't, in this time, go out and identify how we're supposed to do with each child in this small time that we have. But we can give us some general principles on what it takes to be the most godly, incredible parent that you can be. And it involves cultivating yourself so that you can be all that God has wanted you to be. Amen? Amen. So there's a couple people in the Bible who were some great parents. There was somebody like Hannah, and, uh, but one of the people that, that I often don't hear talked about as a parent is Job. And most of the time we don't hear Job talked about as a parent is because we don't want to be anywhere near Job's life. That's the truth. Because what we know, the majority of the book of Job is about the suffering of Job for the glory of God, for God to be able to prove his point to Satan that Job would love him anyway. How many of us don't want any of that in our life? I want it easy. I want it plain. Let's make it convenient. See, so we don't even want to go to Job, but Job has an amazing story because before any of the suffering comes in, we find out about the person that is Job, and we can learn some amazing things about being parents from Job. So I want us to go ahead and look at this text as we begin to talk about this incredible parent. And one of the things I was going to do in this series is I was going to deal with motherhood and fatherhood. And one of the things that the Lord spoke to me as I was planning this, and I, and I, I called Sister Deborah and talked to her about that, was this. We have so many homes that have dealt with so many different forms of brokenness that we often can't say who is in the home right now. We don't know if it's a mother. We don't know if it's a father. You can preach a sermon on motherhood, and there could be a whole section of people in your church that don't have a mother, that may have never had that relationship, fatherhood, that have never had it. It doesn't matter today if you're a mother If you're a father, if you're a grandparent, it doesn't matter. If you're an adopted parent, if you're a foster parent, if you follow these principles in uh, in your life to, to cultivate your relationship with your children, you will become a healthier parent, okay? So we're not gonna let our situations get in the way. We're gonna let God's word speak to us as parenting as a whole, amen? So Job 1, 1, and it says this. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, And that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and turned away from evil. The very first thing we're going to see about this incredible parent who was Job is that, and we should learn, is that an incredible parent has an incredible witness. Let me say that again. An incredible parent has an incredible witness. Here's the reality. If if your children weren't around and people who knew you well were talking about you, would they refer to you with words that are godly? or worldly? Would they refer to you in in things like, this is a person of prayer, this is a person who has consecrated themselves, this person is holy, or would they be like, you know, she can put away two and a half bottles of wine at one sitting. She can curse like a sailor. Boy, she can dance all night in the club. 
See, there's a reality. What made Job a special person and a person that we should look after in our own lives is that if you looked at the testimony of Job, if you looked at who they referred to as Job, they didn't say Job was this and Job was, they said this what? Job was a man who was blameless and upright and one who feared God and turned away from evil. If people were to speak about your character, what would they say? And that is an important thing in parenting because I'm going to tell you this, I, I don't believe this expression, but I believe there is some truth to it. People say there is more that is caught than taught. More that is caught than taught. I don't actually believe that. I believe that more is taught than caught, okay? I believe that, that people can't just catch everything, but that you have to be intentional about the teaching. But here's the thing. If you teach something, but your character does not back up what you're teaching, your teaching means absolutely nothing. And as parents, we have to understand our children are watching us. I'm preaching to myself right now because I'm going to just tell you the truth. I am a grumpy, I can be Oscar the Grouch sometimes. I'm just going to tell on myself. Like, I mean, that, that, that whole thing. And especially before 11 a.m., okay? If it's before 11 a.m. and I have not been to Starbucks, just watch out. My, my sweet daughter, Gabby, she's right here over in the corner. Gabby has gotten in a routine. Sometimes when I go get Starbucks the night before, she will go to the fridge. Y'all ever seen the Snickers commercial where the guy is looking like somebody else and they hand him the Snickers bar and then he turns into the person that he really is? Sometimes I get up grumpy and Gabby will go to the fridge and say, here's your Starbucks. And then it's like, boom, and I'm a whole nother person. But I can be a, a, a grumpy person. And it's amazing to me how there was one day I was sitting at the house and her and her sister were fussing at each other. And I'm like, you need to stop fussing. And all of a sudden, I just heard these, these holy police alarms go off and say, why should she stop fussing when you're always fussing? And I had to sit there and think, you know what? What testimony will my children tell about me? Okay? Well, they say, you know what? This person, they were about money. They spent all their time chasing money. They spent all their time at work. Or will they be able to say, this person spent their time on their knees. This person spent their time in prayer. They spent time in the Word. They were speaking the Word over themselves. They were living out a life that the Bible talks about. Or will they just say, this person, all they did, all they cared about was football. All they cared about was their clothes. All they cared about was this stuff. Job was a man whose character was blameless. When they looked at his life, blameless means no blame. Pretty simple, isn't it? That means that there was no place in his life that they could look and they could say, there's a term that I hear a lot of kids use that was ratchet. Okay? There was no place in his life that somebody could look at and say, okay, you know what? He's good here, but there's a ratchet area. See, the, the godly parent is the one who is looking at their own life, analyzing their own life and saying, you know what? There's an area of my life that doesn't look like Jesus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cultivate that area to look more like Jesus. I'm going to put the time in. I'm going to put the work in. I'm going to be intentional about cultivating this area. That is the first thing it takes to be an incredible parent is you have to be authentic. See, all parents, I believe that I don't, I, you know, with a very rare exception, I believe parents really do have their, their children's best intentions in mind. Don't you? We have great dreams and aspirations for our kids. We want to push them to these heights. But herein lies the problem. If you're not living out a life that shows them what it should look like, then you're not really creating a pathway for them to walk in. One of my favorite preachers, a guy named by the name of Crawford Loritz, says that when it comes to, to this, he said, you need to become the, des the desired destination at which you hope your people will arrive. And I think that that's a great way to look at parenting. You need to become the desired destination that you want your children to arrive at. Now, let them get there and then take it further. But set the example for them first. The first thing we got to do is we got to have a credible witness. We have to be able to look at our lives and say, this is who I am. This is what needs to change. Let's make the changes. Amen? But the second thing we see, even in this verse right here, is an incredible parent has a second thing. They fear God. An incredible parent fears God. Look at that verse again. Job, it says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. That was the first thing, was talking about his character. Now it says, one who feared God and turned away from evil. And I think this is important. They say blameless and upright, and they put those two together, bracket those together. But then you take feared God, right, and turned away from evil, and you've put those together. Let me tell you why. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
That's what it said, the fear of the Lord. Now, I know that I heard Oprah Winfrey on her interview talk about how could I love, how could I follow a God who I have to be a, a afraid of or a God who's jealous for me? Guess what? That's, it, when it says fear God, it doesn't mean just that we tremble in fear. It means that we have a reverential relationship and perspective of God. Okay? It means that we reverence him. We, we stand in awe of him. Here's the reality. Most of us get so busy that we don't even reflect on God. But if we were to ever just sit down every day, take five minutes in the morning, and look at the vastness, the awesomeness, the mighty and magnificence of the God who created all things just by speaking, it should humble us. We just sort of say, I stand in awe of you. We should literally wake up in the morning cultivating a life that says, I'm going to stand in awe of you. Why should we stand in awe of God? Because he said, let there be light. And there was light. And he separated the day from the night and the waters from the lands. And he didn't even get his hands involved. Then when he decided to actually get his hands involved, he reached down into the inanimate, lifeless dirt, carved out the shape and figurine of a human being, breathed into the nostrils of that human being, and life came into that human being. Sand ceased being sand and began to develop capillaries and began to develop a blood and began to develop systems all from inanimate dirt. And all of a sudden, what was once dirt came to life as a man. God did that that. He is that awesome and he is that powerful. And we need to be the people who stand in awe. Why? Because it says he feared God and turned away from evil. When you fear God, it will be the thing, the catalyst that makes you turn away from evil. Watch this. People who live lives of sin have no reverential fear of God. And one of the ways we do that is a lot of us, we like to numb ourselves. There's a lot of people in the world who, when they don't want to feel something, they go out and they take uh, uncontrolled substances in order to dull their senses and feelings. Well, let me tell you this. There is a way that we do that. And that, that way that we do that is really by not reflecting on God. So if we're living lives where we just get into the motion of our day, the second that our feet hit the floor, we're already running. We don't take time to reflect. We don't take time to read his word. We don't take time to pray. We don't even listen to the audio Bible. We won't even sing a worship song in the car. Now we're not thinking about him. We're thinking about work. We're thinking about this assignment. We're thinking about this. We're thinking about this game. We're thinking about this. And now guess what? We're dulling our senses to who God is. And now what happens is that when we get faced with situations and we have to make decisions as to whether we're going to live with the conviction and character of God or whether we're going to live like the rest of the world, since we've been numbing ourselves to God, we don't access the power of God and we walk away from the decisions that God would have us make. And here's why that's important. Let me tell you this. The first thing about being a parent is your own character. You know, I've had to realize this. The Bible is a very simple thing. The first thing about everything is getting right with God. It's about walking with God. And so we have to be people who fear God. And the only way that that's going to happen is when we walk with him. If you walk with God, then you realize how small you are and how big he is. The Bible says, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high God shall abide under the shadow of his wings. Do you realize that God is so big that even at our largest, all we can do is abide under the shadow of his wings? We need to fear God and then be able to turn away from evil. But the third thing we need is this. Y'all ready? This is where I'm about to start just throwing gut shots at myself. And if they bounce off me and hit you, that's, that's not my fault. I'm just preaching the Bible. Y'all ready for this? You sure? All right. The third thing about an incredible parent is this. They don't allow money to mask their kids' needs. An incredible parent doesn't allow money to mask their kids' need. Let's look at these next thing. It says this. There were born to him seven sons and three daughters. That's verse 2. It says, he possessed 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. So this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. He was the what? The greatest. He had the largest fortune. He was the most established and well-off person in the East. Do we see that in the text? So then look what it says. 
When it goes down, I want to go, I want to skip now. And I, and I want to see this. Let's go to verse five. And we're going to come back to four, but it says this. When the days of the feast had run their course, course, Job would send and consecrate them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. Job was the most well-off established person. You know what he probably could have done? He could have sent his kids to the after school program and said they're going to get right. He could have said, you know what? I'm just going to buy them a switch or an Xbox or some shoes. Uh, I'm going to provide cable. I'm going to put them in a nice house in a nice neighborhood with a nice school. And I'm going to believe that now I don't have to worry about my kids having any issues. See, we've become a society that we believe that if we're well off, our children are well off. But one of the things we're seeing in the world is that there are a lot of well off kids who are broken on the inside. There are kids whose parents are in the best socioeconomic class there is, yet their child is looking for a reason to live and doing drugs and promiscuous and everything else, just trying to find some reason and, and to, to even care about life. And where are those parents? Parents are so preoccupied with providing stuff that they don't look to care for the heart and spirit and soul of their children. Have you gotten so busy with work, so busy with, 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 with things that your kids can play sports, that they can be a part of every uh, team, that they can be a part of every program, that they can do ballet, that they can do gymnastics, all of the stuff that our area provides. Are we so preoccupied with that that we don't take the time to sit down and talk with them about their heart and introduce them to Jesus ourselves? Or is it, hey, we're going to go to the church that has the best youth ministry program. That way I can throw my kids back there in this room and leave that responsibility to somebody else. Y'all don't have to like me on this, but it's the truth. It's the times. This is the sign of the times. We have parents who have never even learned to disciple their own kids. And let me tell you this. Discipleship is a built-in part of parenting. It's not a part that we can separate. It does not go, we're a disciple. We, we deal with discipleship and we deal with parent. You are your child's first discipler. And nothing financial, guess what? Finances fix financial things. The Spirit of God fixes spiritual things. You can't, it doesn't work like that. You can't go, guess what? My finances are going to fix his spirit. No, what you're going to do is end up broke with a broken child. We have to have the time and energy and effort and initiative and intentionality to pour into our child's life. And guess what? Many of us didn't grow up with that. Many of us, I come from a single parent home. My mother, when I was young, I remember my mother being a waitress. And in order for her to do her job, I would ride the bus to work with her. And then she would put me in the back in the manager's office with a coloring book and a Tonka truck while she worked and waited tables. Her time was thin, and so she did the best that she could. But guess what? It does not matter where you come from. Where God has placed you now is where he has you now, and that doesn't give you the right to not sit down and be intentional about, about pouring into your kids. If all you have in the house is one of those large coffee table Bibles with the hologram Jesus on it, Maybe I'm the only one that had one of those houses. And if we were to pick that Bible up off the table, there would be a dust ring around where the book was. We might need to reassess our priorities in parenting. Guess what? If you don't know how, learn. Guess what? We are the generation with endless resources. If I want to look up devotions, guess what? I can go on the Internet and look up devotions for my children. If I don't know how to read the Bible with my kids, guess what I can do? I can go to YouTube and watch somebody else reading the Bible with their kid and learn how they did it. We have endless resources to learn this, but we need to take the time and intentionality and make it sure, make sure that this is something that we're prioritizing. Amen? Four. I got two more, and this is it. The fourth thing we learned about uh, an incredible parent from Job is this, is that he, you, an incredible parent cultivates a family unity and identity. Everybody say family unity. Okay, when I mean family unity, what I mean is family togetherness. How many of y'all know families that don't want to be anywhere around each other? 
Mm -hmm. How many of y'all got some family members you don't want to be anywhere around? Okay? Now, I understand that. There's some people we don't get along with, but as a parent, you're going to have these times where your kids begin to age and their personalities begin to pop out and there may be conflict between the personalities. Like older brother and younger brother. Okay? And it, sound, it feels like you're living in a battlefield. As a parent, we have a responsibility to try to cultivate within our kids a sense of family togetherness. God gave us these families. We have to wire into the DNA of our kids the fact that this is your family. You love your family. You care for your family. You prioritize your family. You are there for your family. You support your family. Guess what? If we make a commitment to that now, Maybe when they're older, they'll still be able to function and fellowship together. Look at Job's situation right here. Look at this. Verse 4, his sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. Okay, all that told me right there is that each one of them used to have a feast in his house. I know lots of brothers and sisters who have feasts in their own house and don't invite anybody else over, right? But let's, let's, what it's saying, though, is that each one had it on his day, means that they were feasting together in their homes, and they invited the other brother. But then look what it says. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. What in the world is this? Now, hold on. There's a couple of things I want you to realize. These are infant kids. Hallelujah, praise Jesus. They got their own homes. Can I get an amen from some parents in here? How many of us are one day hoping that these kids will get up out our house, get out our fridge, get out our pocket, and get in their own stuff? Can I get an amen for that? A couple kids went. Look, there will be a day. Watch this, parents. It may seem hard. Now, I'm preaching to myself right now. There will be a day. Hallelujah. No, I ain't going to go there. But there will be a day when you will no longer be responsible for your child's grocery bill. Hmm, Jesus. Hallelujah. There will be a day when you no longer will be responsible for your kids' transportation. And if they're driving, you won't have to pay for their gas. Amen? The question is, when you get to that day, what kind of child will you have cultivated and created? What Job had done was he was very intentional, and we can see this. There was something that was done. We don't have the exact details of how he did it, but there was something that was done that when these kids were older in their own homes, they still had a sense of community and unity and family, and they brought each other together, and they fellowshiped together, and they ate together, and they, think about that. They had a deep, meaningful relationship together. As families, do we spend time actually cultivating that? Sometimes in order to do that, Gabby, we got to snatch your cell phone away and say, you're going to be present in this conversation. And that's what we have to do in my own home. I got, I got an 11-year-old with a cell phone. I mean, that's the anti-family right there. Can I get an amen on that? iPads, iPhones, Xboxes, Nintendo Switch, we can be riding in the car. And each one of them will have headphones. We have a rule in my car now. One ear. You can have one headphone on one ear, but the other ear better stay uncovered because if I call your name and I call you twice, you in trouble already. We in the same car. See, we can't allow this to happen anymore. We can't allow things to rule our houses that cause distance. We have to be intentional about bringing community in our families. Sometimes we need to just have a family meeting together. Sometimes we need to pick a night of the week and say, guess what? We're going to sit in this living room together. Y'all get y'all behinds on the couch. I'm going to sit on the chair, and I'm going to sit on the carpet. And guess what? We're going to sit here and look at each other. If you got nothing to say to me, you don't have to say nothing. But you're not leaving this room until we spent some time together. We need to know. And see, the problem with this is things have gotten so distant that a lot of times we don't even know what's going on in our children's lives. Had a situation with one of the schools the other week, and so we went up there, and my wife was telling me this yesterday, and so we went up there to talk to the principal at one of the schools. Uh, none of the kids had done something wrong, but there was just some things going on, and uh, we were talk, communicating with the principal, and she was like, uh, and in the conversation, my wife was saying, yeah, um, my daughter doesn't have that app on her phone. And she was like, how did you stop that? I said, we put the, the block on there that says they have to ask permission from us before they buy an app. And she was like, you monitor your kid's cell phone? We were like, and she's like, yeah, we do. She was like, well, so many of my other parents allow their kids to have privacy. I'm sorry, there is no more privacy. You get privacy when you're grown and you pay your own bills. 
Amen? I want to know what's going on in my kid's life, okay? So there may have to be a day where we all sit down and put all our cell phones on the table, and we're going to say, what's going on? I want to know, but in order to do that, you have to create that sense of unity where, one, you don't want to have to go in your kid's cell phone to get something, but I'm not going to let it stop me either. We want to have the relationship with our children that we've created communi communication amongst all of ourselves, right, so that they can feel confident that if they bring the truth of what's going on in their life to you, that you can handle it the right way. But that involves us being intentional and spending time with them to the point. Things, you don't get comfortable with something happening once. You get comfortable with things that happen continually. So we have to be continual about cultivating this sense of unity. Sometimes we need to just take one kid out. Dads, guess what? It's okay to have a dad-son date. Moms, it's okay to have a mother-daughter. And guess what, dads? You better date your daughter. Mom, take, Sister Sandra, you got three boys. I want you to pick one of them days, make them boys take you out, especially Judah, now that he got a job. Make him take you out to get something to eat. Amen? And then here's what we're going to do. When you walk up to the door, stand there and look at the door until he walks around, grabs the door, and opens it up for you. See, we're not going to teach our people anything by not having relationship with them. It's in that relationship that we have the opportunity to really get to know and train our children. Amen? Let me hurry up. I'm getting out of here. I promise. The final thing that I have for you, this is an incredible parent, covers their children through a lifetime of prayer. This is the last thing. Look at the text. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would sin and consecrate them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did continually. Job prayed. He labored his kids before the Lord. See, we don't understand what it meant to, 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 to go through the effort of having to do burnt offerings and to do all the consecration. First of all, I said he sent for them. He's like, y'all come here. I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to lay hands on you. I'm going to consecrate you. We need to be so intentional about the spiritual development of our kids that the practices of a Christian become a part of our lives together. This is one of the most beautiful things right now when I'm seeing certain families in here together, sitting together, worshiping together, studying the word together. This is the practices of our faith. Now let's take it home and do it too. But Joe, he prayed over those kids. I mean, how many, will your kids be able to look back on their life and say, you know what I remember? I remember somebody sneaking in my room in the middle of the night and putting their hands on the top of my head and praying for me. I didn't know what the heck was going on, but I know that somebody prayed for me. If somebody hadn't been praying for me, I can tell you right now, I wouldn't be here preaching to you. I'd probably already be in the grave dead. When I was chasing after the world and chasing after drugs, chasing after drug dealers, chasing after women, doing all of the stuff that could have got me in the grave, what I did know is that I had a grandmother at home praying for me. I'm talking about pulling out the bottle of holy oil, praying and, and getting on her knees, and one day she's able to show me she has literal journals of the days when she prayed for you and how she prayed for you. Guess what? There is power in prayer. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Do you see things in your children that you don't like right now? Do you see areas in them that they need to develop more? Do you see things that you want to look more like Jesus? Maybe they look like you and you don't need them to look like you in this area. You need them to look like Jesus. Maybe there's some parents who want their kids to be more financially responsible than they are. Maybe they want just some parents in here who say, hey, I used to go around and I was a little promiscuous. and I don't want you to be like that. Don't just tell them, pray for them. Pray that thing up to heaven until God hears and answers those prayers. Are we as diligent with our prayer? as we are at our jobs. This is the reality of what it takes. It involves being intentional as a parent. It really involves being intentional as a parent. As I close, I just want to bring you to Job's story. Very shortly after we read these things, Satan went to God. And he began to talk about your servant Job, right? God said, have you seen my servant Job? And very shortly after this, when all his kids were eating and drinking together and living in the unity that they had been brought up in, the house fell in on the children, and they all died. It's a horrible thought to think about, something happening to one of our children. So I'll leave you with this question. 
if something happened to one of your children today, would you with clean conscience be able to go to God and say that I lived my life out, cultivating myself as a parent, growing as a parent, and I gave them everything that I could about you? The amazing thing about Job is this. As much pain as he was going through, Job had a clear conscience that he was blameless as a parent. And my prayer for you today is that no matter what happens in your child's life, the good and the bad, you can know that you were blameless as a parent because you feared God, you covered him in prayer, you operated with character. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we just come before you right now. We just ask that you would make us the parents <laughs> that you desire us to be. Truth is, we're broken messes. But I praise you that we're broken messes in the hand of the Almighty. And that you can take the fractured, broken pieces of us and put us back together whole and holy. Some of us come from broken families. Some of us come from broken things. Dear God, would you not allow those to be barriers to us being sanctified, incredible parents? Would you allow those hurts and pains, those negative experiences to become bridges that drive us, that make us determined that we're going to give our kids the best that we can? And it's not about the stuff. It's about you. God, I'm praying right now for some parents who are going to begin to reorganize, reorganize their lives this week. Begin to change their schedules up. To spend an extra 30 minutes praying for and with their child. Thanking you for a parent right now in this room. I'm believing by faith there's a parent in this room who's going to pick a day this week and just do devotion with their entire family. God, would you just build us as parents in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed that video. If you would like to see more, please visit our website at lifepointcc.org, where we are believing in God to have a life-changing message waiting for you.